Welcome to the 2021 Rice Alliance Energy Venture Day at the Offshore Technology Conference. My name is Brad Burke, and I'm the Managing Director of the Rice Alliance for Technology and Entrepreneurship. And we're glad that you're all here. Our mission at the Rice Alliance for Technology and Entrepreneurship is to help support the launch and growth of startup tech companies. And the event today is just one way that we do that. Let me tell you a bit about how the day will go today. We have 14 companies that have been hand selected and gone through a screening and evaluation process and have been selected to present today. We'll, they will present in two different sessions. In flight A, we'll have seven companies present and in flight B, we'll have the, the other seven companies present. Each company gets three minutes for presentation and that three minutes will be followed by three minutes of Q&A from an expert panel that we've assembled for today. We have a panel for flight A and we have a separate panel for flight B. After each of the seven companies present in the first session and after the seven companies present in the second session, we will invite everyone, that means all of you who are listening and watching today, to vote on the poll for the companies you think are most promising. So we'll bring that poll up at the end of the first set of companies and we'll bring it up again uh, for the second set of companies. Halfway through, we'll take a quick break, about a five minute break to get to allow you to get refreshed and come back. This is gonna be a fast paced two hours with 14 companies presenting quick pitches for three minutes each. So who are the companies that are presenting today? So we've got 14 energy technology ventures that are presenting. And in fact, those companies have already raised more than $100 million in early stage funding to date. Those companies come from three countries and come from within the US, come from all the way from as far west as New Mexico and as far east as New York State. So we welcome all of you. And I know that this virtual format allows you to participate uh, more fully and allows all the attendees today to present, uh, to participate and to be able to watch you uh, present your, your ventures. I do want to say a big thanks to our 2021 energy sponsors. Without this great group of sponsors, we wouldn't able to be able to do programs like these and other programs that are coming up later this year. So a big thanks to all of our sponsors, and I wanna say a special thanks to our top tier sponsors, and that includes Chevron, ExxonMobil, Shell, Saudi Aramco Energy Ventures, Wells Fargo, Halliburton Labs, Citi, Baker Botts, Mercury Fund, Norton Rose Fulbright, and Tudor Pickering Holt. I thank you so much for all of your uh, supporting what we do and all of the sponsors that are supporting us, including our community, partners as well. One of those community partners is the Canadian Consulate, and they always do a great job bringing promising companies to us for our events. And you'll see some of those companies today. So thanks again for all of the supporters of today's event. <clears throat> now, last thing before we get started today with our presentations, just to make give you guys a heads up on what's coming up on se September 16th our new Rice Alliance Clean Energy Accelerator will have our first class demo day coming up on September 16th virtually. So I hope you join us virtually on September 16th for the Rice Alliance Clean Energy Accelerator demo day. I also invite you to come back and join us in person in January on January 27th for the 19th annual Rice Alliance Energy Tech Venture Forum. We postponed that event from September of this year to January 27th to make sure that we could accommodate all of you in person at this year's event. So join us for those upcoming events in September and coming up in January. So with that, let's get on to the first part of the program today in the first sessions. Before I introduce the first company, I do want to say a big thanks and introduce the panelists who will be asking questions for three minutes for the companies in this session. So big thanks to Murray Smith from ConocoPhillips, JC Chambers from DCP Technology Ventures, Amy Henry from Unique Ventures, and Anup Padar from EV Private Equity. 
Thanks so much to uh, all four of you for participating and taking on the challenging role of asking questions live on the spot at the conclusion of each company's three minute, minute presentation. So with that, let's get to that first presentation. So these are the companies presenting in the first session. Remember, they'll have, they'll have seven companies present. They will take a quick break. Each of these companies will have three minutes to present. And let me introduce the first company up uh, for session one, Evis. Evis, uh, you're up. And if you will, I will stop my screen share so that you can share your screen. And if there you go, I see you. All right, Brad, thank you. I can hear you. If you'll share your screen and share your slides. There you go. I see him coming up. Perfect. You can okay. see it. Great. Thank you. All right. So um, all water-based, um, sorry, all water-based processes are subject to mineral fouling and sometimes biofouling, causing efficiency losses and expensive maintenance in heat transfer and filtering elements. Our technology solves the problem by nucleation and crystallization of dissolved salts using a technique called magnetohydrodynamic with a unique design that is highly effective, compact in size, and with a payback of less than two years. Avis anti-fouling devices will bring benefit to a number of industry, HVAC radiant systems, cooling towers, water treatment plants, and maritime cooling systems. We will serve an obtainable market of over $20 billion, with the maritime market being the largest in revenue and the water treatment the one with the biggest social impact. Avis will become the standard anti-fouling for the heat transfer industry and will make water desalination more affordable. So based on market share, the most important competitors are offline cleaning service companies, mechanical cleaning for heat exchangers and chemical washing for cooling towers and membranes. So Avis technology will provide the only option that is effective, eco-friendly and continuous with a short payback. Um, we will offer an aggressive revenue sharing scheme to reach end customers through a network of distribution partners while working on an ambitious marketing plan to reach more partners and territories. The maritime market represents the biggest opportunity as they need frequent mechanical cleaning for the heat exchangers at a very high cost. We expect the traction to come from the cost benefits and the environmental regulations aimed to protect the oceans. Avis is entering a pilot stage testing campaign with a marine research center in Chile with a Pontifical Catholic University and with a brackish water desalination plant in the US, partnering New Mexico State University and the National Alliance for Water Innovation. Both projects will connect Avis with potential customers and partners. We expect to hit the market by late 2022, assembling our own units for small cooling towers in the US and reaching larger customers through our partners. Avis is a C Corp funded by venture capital and angel investors. While we still need to build a strong marketing team, which we will do upon launching our next round, the team we have now is well able to face the technology challenges we have and the product delivery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Evis. At this time, Q&A panelists, please join us with uh, your video and your audio. Thank you so much. One question that I have is, does this reduce the amount of time or does it completely eliminate the fouling? Well, it actually reduces most of the scaling fouling that you have in your um, heat exchanger uh, surfaces or heat transfer surfaces. So depending on the configuration, you can go from 50% reduction to up to 90% reduction. So we can scale up in terms of power, we can scale up in terms of time of exposure of the treatment. So uh, that's something that we are basically doing in this uh, pilot testing campaign to tune our, our machine for the, for the biggest effectiveness without compromising the cost and the, the energy and the general overall efficiency. 
Well, good afternoon, Patricia. I have a, just two questions um, because you, sh you showed a slide that you had a suite of solutions, right? And then with, with those, you know, I'm looking at your, your customer adoption, right? As you go from 50 to 1900 to 8700, right? You know, kind of how do you look at your customer adoption on this and which one of those? I mean, what's, what's, which is the focus area in your suite of solutions that you're offering? Well, we actually need we actually need to build our our partnership with with manufacturers and and vendors in the different industry. We want to go for the small and medium size um, cooling towers in the U.S. We have more than two million units of cooling towers that are in need of chemical washing or cleaning treatment every year. So uh, we are in contact with them, trying to go and work with them to further test and customize our units for them. But uh, on the other side, I uh, think that we, we're being uh, working with, with the maritime market strongly with, with um, kit exchanges manufacturers in Sweden and Germany and here in the US, which are the largest manufacturers. And um, by having this test campaign in Chile and here, we're gonna be in contact with those providers and, and manufacturers. So. That's, that's the mix that we want to have in order to uh, do the, the work of uh, acquiring customers. And I guess just to build on JC's question from earlier, um, just with regards to the process here, are there any sort of, uh, what's the outputs coming from the heat exchanges? Is it uh, the buildup of the fouling or is there other byproducts that come out of the, the process? Uh, the, the way that we are inserting our unit is as a pre-state unit. So we treat the water before entering into the heat exchangers such that we get this crystallization. We are improving the shear forces of the, the, the entire flow. So we're not gonna have this adherence inside the walls. And if there is any before our machine, we're gonna be able to remove that. We have tested this for hundreds of times during the last five years. So that's the way it works. So thank you, Eva, so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Q&A right. is thank over. You. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Next up, we have Angara Industries. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me well? Yes, you are good to go. OK, I'm glad to speak to you today. And I'll tell you the story of my investment that turned into a full-time job at Angara. And before that, I used to be a VC uh, like yourselves. In brief, Angara is an emerging uh, business that enables creation of a $50 billion of an annual, annual economic value and about 1 billion tons of CO2 emissions abatement uh, through energy efficiency. Uh, simply put, we help our customers to run their heat exchangers cleanly and efficiently all the time and to focus on downstream, oil downstream. Uh, we all know that oil industry urgently needs now uh, efficient and scalable CO2 abatement solutions. Angara is one of such solutions. In brief, it's a gigaton CO2 abatement solution that pays for itself. We currently focus on defining processes that require a lot of heat. They result in lots of CO2 emissions. Much of those emissions uh, come from burning fuel to heat oil. And uh, in this example, uh, in, in a uh, refinery example, uh, two thirds of the uh, heat can be recovered, uh, but that's when your heat exchangers are clean. And unfortunately, they're not clean most of the time. They get fouled and you recover less heat. Uh, and as a result, you need um, uh, burning more fuel. The oil industry, the downstream industry, uh, learn to live with this uh, problem and the mechanical cleaning, i.e. hydroblasting, is the main method to remove the fouling during shutdowns. To add to this problem, well, uh, CO2 emissions uh, uh, are generated in hundreds of millions of tons because of the fouled heat exchangers. So luckily we developed a technology that enables very effective fouling removal. It's based on a fouling fracturing uh, solution that uh, uh, gives uh, refineries freedom to remove, uh, to clean heat exchangers pretty much any time. Combined with smart scheduling, our technology uh, can change the paradigm of the uh, heat exchanger maintenance so that we can move to uh, always clean or almost always clean um, uh, uh, heat exchangers paradigm, thus avoiding those uh, uh, fuel inefficiencies and uh, CO2 emissions. 
For that, we are partnered uh, with and partnering with uh, various players in the industry, and we act as a technology provider so uh, that we can reshape this uh, segment uh, uh, and uh, expand it in, in size. Um, this technology has been already proven with quite a few oil companies, and with some, we're already scaling up this solution. Uh, overall, if you add some other industry segments, it can be a $50 billion market opportunity. And for that, we're teaming up with uh, some uh, major players, uh, examples you can see below. Uh, and uh, this is quite a big uh, size of the new market uh, to keep everybody motivated. Our leadership team is uh, quite experienced also in oil and gas. As you can see, some of them are like Panas Kavalakas. He, also, he used to run an oil company himself. And overall, we are sure we can deliver on our uh, uh, vision. Our advisory we're board. at time. Um, we need to go ahead and move on to Q&A. So panelists, if you will please join with your camera and unmute yourselves. Okay. Just to jump in here, what is the financials of this company just now? So, so far we generated about one and a half million dollars on those uh, pilot projects and some commercial projects. This year we made about $200,000 and we uh, signed another 200,000 uh, with uh, Total. We expect to generate about uh, five, $6 million next year uh, based on our current pipeline. Uh, I'll just jump in on piggyback on top of that with the pilots you've done so far, then, then what, what, what are your plans with your technology stack with future pilots and how are you scaling that up going to, to, to larger um, applications? And, and what does that timing look like? So typically we start with a pilot, everybody will, every oil company wants uh, to do a pilot project first. Uh, so currently we're doing pilot projects uh, with uh, Total in the Netherlands. We're scheduled to do a pilot project with Chevron in, uh, in California next May. And a number, a number another uh, four or five uh, projects are scheduled uh, to be done in the next uh, six to eight months in, uh, in Europe. So currently our main focus is on Europe. And uh, once we do this, then we go to the next stage, uh, basically going that always uh, cleanliness maintenance paradigm. That's what we do uh, already with PPCGC, Loop Oil, and a couple of more companies. Did I answer your question? The customers that have done pilots, have you converted them into full-time customers? Uh, we are in the process of doing so, like for example, on this, uh, I can share this uh, screen. Uh, yes, like Luke Oil, uh, PTTGC, we're currently um, uh, agreed on a roadmap to implement this technology at scale. Unfortunately, last uh, one and a half month uh, years with the COVID uh, basically restricted to do uh, uh, a lot of jobs for the, for the clients. But otherwise, uh, Luke Oil, Gazprom Neft, Cebu and PTTGC, we're uh, scaling up with them. Uh, like for example, look well, we agreed on a roadmap uh, to deploy this technology with uh, their five refineries. Just to jump in right real quick is on your, your solutions, a combination between kind of your, the, you know, your solutions and your hardware, right? And, and, and how that's being offered to your customers. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question again? Because with, uh, uh, with your technology, with your technology, and you know, show the kind of these partnership, you can flip the the kind of your diagram of the whole, yep. you know, kind of process and engineering flow of all of that. Yeah, and you know, right here. Then, then, how is this offering being done versus you know, chemical producers, you know, IoT, you know. How, okay. What is your business model as you're going forward? Uh, for okay. Potential? Unfortunately, I apologize sure. for cutting us short. We are at time. Thank you, Q&A panelists. Thank you, Ingaris. We do have to move on to applied bioplastics. Uh, happy to catch up uh, later. Okay, sorry. Alex, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Working on it. Can you see it? Yeah, you're ready to go. 
Excellent. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex, co-founder of Applied Bioplastics. Let's talk about the economic expansion driven by durable plastics over the last century. Planes, trains, and automobiles, toys, tools, and technology, all cheaper, lighter, more accessible to more people. Plastic is an amazing invention, and that's why even though it's already everywhere, demand for plastic is still growing faster than the expansion of the human race. In 2015, plastic production accounted for 1.8 billion metric tons of CO2 emissions. If projections hold, emissions will reach 6.5 billion metric tons per year by 2050, over 15% of the total human carbon budget. A particular concern are durable polymers, which make up over half of all plastic produced annually. Yet most alternatives are focused on the plastic waste problem, primarily reducing single-use plastics like LDPE and PET with expensive biodegradable alternatives, which leaves a major hole in the sustainable plastics market. At Applied Bioplastics, we make bioplastics for durable goods manufacturers that are cost competitive, mechanically identical, globally scalable, and most importantly, vastly reduce those net carbon emissions. We do this in several ways. Uh, reduction of petrochemical inputs, carbon sequestration in the soil, carbon sequestration within our durable composites, and by diverting waste biomass from being burned and composted. We're able to compete directly with legacy plastics on price because we use abundant, renewable, and most importantly, inexpensive and widely available plant material. This is possible because we've achieved a major breakthrough in cellulose processing, a low capex proprietary technology that allows us to use cellulose from nearly any kind of fast growing fibrous biomass, which is revolutionary. Anything from processed hemp to agricultural waste to lawn clippings, we'll take it all and turn it into usable, valuable plastic composites. In the last two years, we've secured our IP, competed in and won several well-known business competitions, including at South by Southwest, built a team of 20, and begun acceptance testing with some of the world's largest manufacturers. At scale, we'll be reducing the CO2 output of manufacturing by hundreds of millions of metric tons, and further product improvements like using recycled or ocean-recovered plastic will push those gains even higher. Better yet, we'll be meeting multiple UN SDGs by empowering rural communities and emerging economies by purchasing both farmed fiber and agricultural waste at fair trade prices. We're confident in our success because our process and our products are drop-in replacements for both feedstock manufacturers and their customers. We use the same industry standard machines to produce our plastic pellets as everyone else, and the temperature, timing, and equipment for their use by our customers doesn't change at all. Several of our prospects are currently engaged in acceptance testing without making any changes to their typical production lines, and when they're finished, we'll have proven that rapid global adoption of our plastic alternative is an achievable goal this decade. We're engaged with half a dozen manufacturers in the Fortune 20, as well as several other household names responsible for big chunks of the total plastic manufactured annually. By 2030, we plan on delivering nearly 5 million metric tons and helping manufacturers avoid over 4 million metric tons of carbon emissions. Out of an annual total addressable market starting at 120 million metric tons, we expect to claim a 1.5% share by 2025. Delivering on that market share allows us to generate significant profit rapidly. Over five years, we will accumulate over $230 million and be generating $130 million in profit annually. Our strongest asset beyond our intellectual property is our team. With a century and a half of experience in plastic, five PhDs, experienced business and sales leaders, and a bunch of talented youngsters dying to change the world, then yes, of course, a UT and a Rice alumni or two, we know that what starts here will change the world. After two years of work, we're months away from capturing our first revenues from some of the largest brands on the planet, supplying only two Thank to you, three Alex. customers. Unfortunately, we are at time. We're going to move on to Q&A. Cool. So if you want to jump on. Just just quick question. Um, can you see us? Uh, yep. Two questions. Um, kind of what, what is the degradation, because that's been some issues in, historically with the bioplastics in the space and composting. And the second one is how much feedstock do you need to have and, and, and where are those sources of your feedstock in order to, to reach the, the volumes that you intend on producing? So we don't do biodegradable. That's uh, that's the first uh, uh, you know value proposition that we do. We're we're making durable goods or durable plastic for durable goods manufacturers. Um, so we're talking about cars, trains, planes, automobiles, you know, toys, tools, technology, things that get used for a long period of time. Also, our polymer is recyclable. As far as the fiber sources. Um, we have a number of different fiber sources from all over the world. Um, you know, we, we can use anything from, from processed hemp to lawn clippings. We have a big focus on agricultural waste. Um, because our strategy is so low capex and, and uses off-the-shelf equipment, we're able to set up very low capex uh, fiber treatment facilities anywhere in the world where they're close to both our fiber sources and our customers. Thank you. Alex is jumping in there. What's the uh, ability for making complex shapes? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of material out there that are used for quite complex components now. Uh, how much flexibility have you got in that space to build some of those complex 
Currently, we can hit a 20 MFI. Um, obviously, some manufacturers require things as high as 30, so that does limit our applications in some cases. But with uh, you know large format plastics being a, a major part of the toys, tools, technology, and transportation, uh, we're not too worried about that limiting our markets. Thank you. Going back to Amy's question here, if it is non-degradable, then what's the difference with the conventional plastic used for the same material? There's a significant difference in the CO2 required for manufacturing. Um, we, we can offer benefits of up to 40% without biodegradation. Thank you. So in California, the bioplastics, normally you have to put that with organics. Is that the same or can this be recycled as, as a normal plastic? This can be recycled as a normal plastic, depending on the fiber length, of course. Uh, sometimes it'll go into the, uh, the composite stream. Sometimes it's able to go into the uh, homogenous plastic stream. Thank you. What is your TRL level on this technology? Um, we are currently in commercialization. Uh, we have uh, several customers who are doing line trials as the, as the screen shows here. Um, you know, essentially what we're doing right now is we're raising a seed round of 350K in order to stand up our own fiber treatment facility at a pilot scale. That being said, however, we have a number of different partnerships uh, that enable us to send out samples today, and we can also scale those partnerships today. It's just simply not cost effective and, and, and doesn't allow us to compete at price parity. Uh, we're also hoping to start a Series A later this year after we complete our seed round uh, in, in order to, to move to full commercialization scale. Thank you, Applied Bioplastics, and thank you, Q&A panelists. We're going to go ahead and move on to American Hydrogen. Great. Can everyone hear me? Yes. If you want to make sure. There we go. Better? Yeah. If you want to go ahead and present, put it in present mode. Absolutely. All right. We can hear you and we can see you. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Brooks, and today I'll be presenting on behalf of American Hydrogen. American Hydrogen represents a consortium of technical professionals with a long history of execution experience in the energy sector. Our senior management team are veterans of the oil and gas industry with over two decades of operating history, working to develop large-scale, multi-million dollar energy infrastructure projects. As the world races to decarbonize, hydrogen is well positioned to play a central role in the energy transition. This is especially true in the United States, given its abundance of natural gas and existing gas distribution infrastructure. At present, over 95% of domestic hydrogen generation takes place at refineries. As the demand for hydrogen grows over the coming decade, refinery generation will no longer be sufficient, leading to underserved segments of the market. Recognizing this opportunity, American Hydrogen has developed its own suite of hydrogen generation technologies. Our technologies utilize steam methane reforming, a proven process which convinces conventional natural gas into hydrogen through a reaction with water and heat. We've integrated our SMR with a carbon capture and storage system, effectively decarbonizing the generation process. The result is blue hydrogen, a more sustainable alternative to hydrogen generation. We are also strategically partnered with an electrolyzer manufacturer out of the European Union, allowing us to furnish a green hydrogen pathway. As solar and wind continue to take market share in power generation, we see this technology as crucial to, to ensuring consistent and reliable access to renewable electricity. Unlike traditional equipment manufacturers, American Hydrogen is a fully integrated company with competencies in engineering, construction, and operations. These competencies allow us to support projects at any point in their development, whether pre-feed or well into asset commercialization. We structure our commercial offerings to meet the various needs of our customers, whether that's owning generation and selling hydrogen under long-term contracts, turnkey generation facilities for outside operators or technology sales and third-party licensing opportunities. Looking ahead, our goals in the immediate term are threefold. The first is strategic partnerships. We are actively looking to joint venture with entities in the oil and gas sector with assets that are accretive to the carbon sequestration or EOR process. We are also creating our own hydrogen markets through relationships with end users in sectors like transportation and agriculture. Once confined to traditional hydrogen generation hubs, these sectors are finding cost advantages in the distributed generation model. Lastly, we are actively looking for capital partners interested in participating not only at the corporate, but also project level financing. Our corporate office is based in Tulsa with additional offices in Dallas, Houston, and a 100,000 square foot manufacturing facility in Midland. I'd like to thank the industry panel, those tuning in at home, and Rice University for the opportunity to showcase our firm and its offerings. I'll now take any questions. 
Do you have any plants up and running? No, sir. We have two projects in, I would say, past Bell 2 of development where we have an EPC slotted and they are insurance prepped and proceeding through asset commercialization. Those, those systems are about 75% tenanted. And so we're just getting that last 30% to proceed with a financial decision. Good question. What is your technology? And then what is your pathway, as you mentioned, uh, to uh, go for your green hydrogen pathway that you're working on right now? So the technology that we manufacture in-house is the SMR that is either one, five or 10 tons. And that is packaged by our manufacturing facility in Midland. The green hydrogen pathway is with a company out of the European Union where we are their strategic manufacturer of their electrolyzer. And so our focus to date is really blue hydrogen. We feel in the immediate term, the infrastructure in place is most accretive to that reaching commercial scale. Um, but over the next, let's call it 10 to 15 years, we see electrolyzers in the green hydrogen pathway really taking market share. Mm -hmm. I guess given the uh, the push for blue hydrogen uh, at the moment, you know, how do you feel that you're stacking up against the competitors competitors in terms of timing to get a product out to market? I know that we are about thirty percent cheaper than competitors competing with SMRs at our scale, and we're also, I would say, four to six months ahead of schedule in terms of if you were to submit us a PO today, us delivering a unit to you and getting it on the ground. <laughs> I'm starting to really understand kind of how are you different from existing uh, SMR technology? Is is it really more from the costing side or, you know, how do you explain that to potential customers? How do we differentiate ourselves from other SMRs on the market today? Mm -hmm. It's really the modularity of our units. Um, you'll see vendors on the market today focusing on that one ton scale. And then you have up to refinery scale where we like to focus on the five and 10 ton offering. Um, we feel in terms of distributed generation, that is the most economic. And you're serving markets that are less focused on industrial gas users and more markets focused on transportation and um, agriculture. What's the cost per kilogram of hydrogen? Your um, our, yeah, our levelized cost to produce hydrogen is $1.87. The others, by your number, you're saying others are producing for close to $3? Yes, sir. I've seen that in the market. Um, I mean, you get a varying range anywhere from, let's call it $1.50 all the way up to 6 or $7, depending on whether it's blue, green, or gray. And when is the first revenue? Um, we anticipate our first revenue in Q2 of next year. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, American Hydrogen. At this time, we're going to move on to ANCAT. And thank you, panelists, as well. Hi, Sue, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. You want to go ahead and put it in presentation mode, and you're good to go. Hello everyone, my name is Su Wang, CEO of ANCAT company. We were initially set out to solve one problem, removing the toxic heavy metal from a current high performance equation paint, which has been named the number one toxic enemy of the military and aviation industry. Its leakage to the environment are led to the largest legal settlement in US history featured in the movie Aaron Brockwich. However, after 50 years of worldwide high profile intense R&D efforts, NASA already sent numerous rockets into space, but they cannot find a single toxic-free anti-quotient paint to protect their space rocket or launch facility. And was only success. And surprisingly, we also broke the limited coating performance limit by a whopping six times, which as if you are telling corrosion experts, human can live six times longer. This unbelievable historical anti corrosion coating breakthrough can advance human society from current iron age to an exciting sustainable age and solve the greatest problems facing humanity today, such as amend the $15 trillion global um, infrastructure budget gap, stop global warming, and save enormous amounts of waste, accidents, and inefficiencies. I'm introducing ANCAP, Drust Legend anti corrosion coating product with its patent uh, nanomaterial and formulation. 
Anka legendary coating performance is not limited to be the only green one and the longest lasting one. Actually, it's outstanding in all performance categories, such as the thinner, lightweight, um, much, much easier to use, and a soft sealing from scratch and pinhole damages. After ANCA flawless record-setting independent corrosion test reports, ANCA also received a flawless 2.5 years marine from the outdoor exposure test a report back from the North Sea of England, three zones, submerged, atmosphere, and tidal zones, and received Solar Impulse Foundation efficient products label last November, in addition to many prestigious world the network we already won. An ANCA technology can easily save billions of dollars per major infrastructure direct repainting costs, such as a bridge, an offshore oil rig, a pipeline, or offshore wind turbine. And the CO2 emission um, save can easily stop global warming. And ANCA sure would disrupt the $63 billion global anti corrosion coating market. And the, the two largest Customer, we're in talking right now with the estimated annual sales. It's already over $4 billion. And the one of guy told me, you know, just paint one of your wind uh, oil rig over there in Gulf area cost $14 million. I just raised $12 million to speed up the contractization process, which will be great investment for you guys. Thank you so much for that. At this time, Q&A panelists, please unmute yourselves and uh, turn on, on your camera. So thanks, very Simone. Much. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, okay, thanks, Anu. Um, yeah, thanks, Su Wong. Just uh, out of curiosity, how is the coating applied? Is it like similar nano coatings where they have, things have to be bathed, you know, put in a big bath or is it actual paint or spray on application? It's the same as the current paint. It's just much, much easier to use without the special surface preparation, which is the 50% of the cost of a paint application and 50% of the time. So we make a high-end anti corrosion paint possible for consumer market. Currently, uh, the high-performance paint much, uh, must be uh, applied by certified you know, uh, uh, paint applicators. So consumer uh, can use high-end paint, no longer Rust-Oleum, yeah. Is there, a, is there a proof of the product which you can you know, talk about? What? What is, the, what is the case study so far? Have you used it somewhere and how long this has protected? The um, we just uh, uh, was, uh, we initially had a proof of concept and win many awards. And uh, we uh, actually uh, was here, but uh, they sent me to accelerate her. We did not go. And uh, we used NSF funding to develop into a product. And uh, through our network, we did an offshore pilot in addition to our record setting independent corrosion test reports. So no large application other than um, the coated panel hanging on the North Sea for two and a half years. But uh, the application uh, method will be similar to current paint, but much easier. Sprayable, you can use a brush or roller. So, so going that you, you, you don't really have kind of, you know, kind of several business use cases, right? So what would a, a good business use case look like for you, right? As, as you're going forward, since you've been working right with now, the accelerators. Right you now, uh, I already passed the uh, uh, two, uh, initial sample test by large automotive manufacturers. Um, it, it one uh, like auto parts, you know, um, each of them will bring billion dollar sales. I, you know, I signed a letter of intent with them uh, for automotive parts. That's one. Another is uh, uh, energy infrastructure of uh, oil rigs, uh, offshore wind turbine, ships, um, building construction. I just win the uh, Axilla City uh, finalist title, which means that we, uh, I'm in the process of gaining city as uh, clients for infrastructures. Thank you, Ankat. That concludes our Q&A. We're going to move on to Connectus Services. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, Mike, when you're ready, you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay, um, it's actually, um, it's Dave Bukvik here. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Connectus. Mike will be unavailable, so I'll be in, presenting in his place today. So just bear with me. Of course. Okay, uh, can anybody, everybody see my screen? You are good to go. Okay. Okay, I'd like to introduce uh, both myself, Dave Bukvik, Chief Marketing Officer of Connectus Global and Connectus Global itself. Um, I'll go through the slides really quickly and then we can do a Q&A session uh, once we're done. Um, Connectus Global provides uh, ultra wide man based technology in our real-time location tracking solution. We use uh, tags and badges and receivers to locate people and equipment, assets and, and uh, um, various uh, valuable items on uh, on location. Um, we've got an integrated suite of services, but we focus primarily on enhanced industrial safety, operational safety, and crisis recovery planning. We were founded in 2018 by our founder um, and CEO, Mike Anderson. Uh, we are a Calgary, Alberta-based company with a satellite office in Houston, Texas. Uh, we've got 10 full-time employees. Primary end markets are energy, mining, and the industrial space, but we have uh, we have dabbled in the entertainment and the event management space as well. Um, our largest partner is uh, Honeywell um, with their uh, with the process solutions. Um, we have a uh, an agreement with them to, for distribution uh, globally. We are their in house brand, and um, we we ideally um, white label through that organization. So being their in house brand uh, has its advantages. Globally, um, total capital injected to date into the company is 1.7 million US. Uh, our annual revenues in 2020 were 800,000, uh, roughly uh, USD, and, um, and in 2021 we've already exceeded 1.3 million USD. Uh, we're seeking up to a three million dollar capital raise and equity financing. Um, we see we received a term sheet already from a lead investor, and a pre-money valuation is set at nine million dollars currently. A little bit about our team, uh, Mike Anderson, Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Connectus Global. Um, he, he's been, um, he's seen a little bit of, a, of the industry's negative side uh, where accidents do take place and, um, and where chaos starts to, uh, starts to rear its ugly head on the, on the locations where an incident, explosion, fire, whatever it may be, may be on location. Um, he then saw a need for a real-time location tracking solution of personnel and assets um, where you can identify who's in their mustering locations and who isn't. Um, a lot of that, a lot of those experiences hit home with me as well, as I have been uh, being in the oil and gas industry myself for the better part of 20 years. I have seen uh, my share of, of incidents on location and um, we want everybody to go home to their families and their children at the end of the, the day. So being able to keep track on personnel when something like that happens is, is imperative. Um, Daryl Nimchuk, our CFO, very seasoned CFO, uh, part of several different exits in the past, um, very good uh, and very, very intricate part of our part of our team. Myself, Chief Marketing Officer, um, I, as mentioned, I've been in the oil and gas sector, cut my teeth working on the drilling rigs and in, in large projects early on, worked my way into the downtown core of uh, Calgary, Alberta, um, climbed up Thank you, Dave. Ranks. Unfortunately, we are at time. We are going to move on to Q&A. So panelists, if you will please join us, we'll go ahead and start. Okay. Hi, Dave. Um, quick question, because I don't think you're able to get to it. Kind of, you know, what is what's the problem that, that you're solving and what is your value proposition for the oil and gas industry? Because um, there's a lot of competition and, and players in this space. So, so kind of what, what, what is the differentiating factor when it comes to connect us in this space. Absolutely, and, and, and I'll take you to this slide in front of us here right now. Um, Geofencing and, um, and, um, and increasing personal safety are some of the problems that we were solving here. So increasing mustering times, knowing where your people are at any given point in time in the face of a catastrophe. Workforce efficiency, um, you're able to uh, identify obstacles that might be in your employee's path or, or efficiencies that might, not, uh, that might not be seen otherwise, but through collection of data, you can see time lost, you can see, you can see 
uh, individuals that may, may be able to increase um, or decrease billing time due to efficiencies that, that can be increased on the job site. Um, going to the top, bottom right or bottom left slide, quicker mustering times as well. When you, when you do have a catastrophe or when you're even just doing a drill, you'll notice that people will, will congregate into the mustering locations. The mechanism counts those individuals themselves without sitting there with a clipboard and uh, doing a head count and re re reducing a non-productive time. You'll have uh, a different mentality and a mindset when uh, people are being, you know, that they're being tracked uh, to some level and uh, an increased productivity happens just psychologically on that side. But uh, you can also, in a, in a manufacturing plant scenario, you can uh, align your plant itself to, um, and in a, such a fashion where, where the actual um, plan can be, uh, you can put a certain equipment in certain places to create efficiencies, less walking time, less delays, uh, that sort of thing. But what, sorry. what has been the biggest challenge for adoption? So can you say that again? Can you repeat that? What has been your biggest challenge in getting this product widely adopted? Um, you know, it's just, uh, I would say it's just changing the culture. Uh, it's the full digital transformation of the companies that we see. Um, although there is a large push in technology right now, we have seen a large increase in, uh, in the adoption of, of uh, digitization. Um, it's basically just changing from the old mentality and the old systems, the old paper and carbon copies to, uh, to a digitized uh, using a tablet and, um, and getting, uh, getting everybody's Again, culture change within your company. Runner. Thank you so much, Connectus. Thank you, Q&A panelists. At this time, we are going to move on to Integrity Technology Solutions. Dave, if you want to go ahead and stop sharing your screen. Thank you so much. You betcha. Okay. All, right. All right, Cody, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and share your screen. I can see you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, you are good to go. Perfect. So, uh, hi, I'm Cody Austin. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Integrity Technology Solutions. At ITS, we are revolutionizing the joint venture accounting and audit space by providing purpose-built solutions utilize machine learning technology. Our solutions are already being used by industry giants such as PetroChina, Sinopec, and Japex. Our automation technology streamlines and simplifies accounting anomaly detection which ultimately reduces human capital costs, increases efficiency, and facilitates better joint venture relationships. The energy industry contraction and COVID-19 pandemic had made, has made this the right time for companies to evaluate anywhere that they can gain an efficiency advantage. Joint venture structures are commonly used in the energy industry as an optimal way to spend or spread risk and expense. In joint ventures, we expect that the vendor does the work, the operator pays the vendor and sends a portion of the charge to a partner, and the partner reimburses the operator for their share. In a perfect world, all joint ventures would look like this. But in reality, the payments are a mess. The root of the problem is caused by inaccurate billings that lead to disputes, slow and costly back and forth review processes that ends in even more expensive audits or even arbitration. In our $400 billion North American energy industry, it takes on average 145 days for a partner to reimburse the operator once an expense is paid, resulting in a potential of $4 billion in interest cost incurred during this time, which only ones enjoying this are the banks. So we built a solution. Our core technology focuses on harnessing the power of data with our AI and ML solution to validate joint interest billings to the complex governing accounting agreements. The result is post audit intelligence that allows us to fix the problems after the fact faster, cheaper, and better, and real time audit intelligence that expedites the operator's time to cash. So, where are we now? We have validated the market with 150K in paid trials, used the concierge model in 2021, are in the final stages of completing a true SaaS user interface for a product that can handle the largest energy projects in the world. So why us? We were auditors first. As a result, we have the data and technical expertise to create practical solutions that solve the problems that even blockchain and smart contracts can't. We have the right team to execute these visions, have assembled a remarkable board of advisors of serial entrepreneurs with proven track records to help guide us. 
We're asking for an investment of 1 million to get us to a 2 million revenues over the next 12 months. The use of funds will be to further the tech development, team expansion, and finalizing our imminent SaaS model transition. And one more thing, we're in the final steps of a distribution partnership with a US software company. They'll see our technology being added to their audit management software that is currently deployed in 52 countries worldwide. Thank you for your time. And I would now like to answer any questions you might have. Cody, what successes have you seen with the anomaly detection? Sure. Um, right away, we, we've seen kind of a comparison here. We did a case study when we took a thousand documents reviewed against a human auditor over an entire day. Um, in 15 minutes, we managed to find 12 errors when an entire eight hour day, the human auditor could only find six. So we, we've initially had very uh, good success with anomaly detection using data faster than the alternative of expensive auditors. Where have you had successful pilots that have led to customers? So kind of, you know, who've been your early adopters in this? And then, you know, what, what, what's the next, you know, I guess, play in your technology stack development, right? This sure. is where you're starting because I know some, there's some other companies in this space. So where do you want to go with this? So we, we've started off um, because we had an affi affiliated uh, audit and accounting services company. We had a very uh, easy transition to be able to sell this as a product upgrade on top of any of their audits, charging anywhere from 2,500 to 25,000. So we were able to obtain data and use it on projects from the likes of Synovus, Sinopec, um, kind of all the way down to kind of the smaller caps like Canlan Energy. So kind of where are we going next with this is we're going to take our core technology and move it from a non-operated perspective into the auditor's office or the operator's office to be able to kind of validate the cost in real time before they actually hit the joint account. So if you're more familiar with kind of like a TSA pre-check in travel, that these transactions have been kind of pre-approved before they get to the non-operated partner. Do you make money per JV per year? How does this work? How does the financial work? Okay, currently we've been doing it kind of concierge where we charge only from 2,500 to 25,000, but we're moving in towards a true software as a service model where we're going to scale it with activity signs. So kind of using the same sort of validation of what a large scale customer would pay on a project base up to 25,000 versus the smaller scale, the 2,500. We want to kind of target different revenue sizes so we can actually uh, target the Camlins of the world as well as the Chevrons and the Shells and the super majors who have... Uh, much higher spends. So with this, within a, a large energy company, who, who's your buyer, right? You know, because you're, you're, you're kind of approaching this from the audit side, I'm familiar with COPUS and, and all these issues with this, but, but, but who's the buyer within the organization? We have two buyers within the organization. From the non operated perspective, it tends to be um, whoever's in control of the audit and kind of recovery side from depending on the company size, that could be your um, controller to your VP of finance on that side. And from the operated side, uh, we've been dealing with kind of the joint venture accounting management teams for some of the larger companies up to kind of the controllers who the joint venture uh, financial portfolio falls under. Thank you so much. We are at time Q&A panelists. Thank you, as well as Integrity Technology Solutions. Let me share my screen. Apologize for the delay. Thanks so much for all the companies that presented it. Apologize for the delay, but uh, we will now 
conclude this first session with a poll. So we would ask all of you to select your favorite company and most promising company from that first set of seven. So if you would vote for the company that you think is most promising, all of you who've been listening today have the opportunity to, to uh, select a company. And while we're doing that, uh, you know, I mentioned at the very beginning of the, the session that this was going to be a fast paced session and it proved out. It's very difficult for companies to present their pitch within three minutes and I thought they did a great job. So thanks to all seven companies that presented. But also it's tough to ask questions for just three minutes. I know that you guys could ask questions for much, much longer than that. So I do want to say a big thanks again to Murray from ConocoPhillips, to JC Chambers from DCP Midstream, to Amy Henry from Unique Ventures, and Anu Padar from EV Private Equity. Thanks all of the panelists for being here to ask the questions of the presenting companies. And last, we will take a quick five minute break. Please, please be back at two o'clock. And so you will have an opportunity to see the second set of companies and we will conclude the program at three, but please be back. Please be back uh, here at two o'clock. Thank you very much.
All right. Welcome back to the second half of today's Rice Alliance Venture Day at OTC. For those of you who missed the intro, my name is Brad Burke. I'm the Managing Director of the Rice Alliance for Technology and Entrepreneurship. And welcome back to the second half. This is a fast paced session. We have seven final companies that'll present. Those seven final companies will each have three minutes to present and three minutes for Q&A. And let me introduce the Q&A panelists for this second session of today. We have Robert Allen from Evoke Innovations, Patrick Conroy from Amberjack Capital Partners, Lisa Zebers from Philip 66, and Abhinav Jain from CSL Ventures. After each company presents, these panelists will have three minutes to ask companies of the, of the presenters who have just pitched. And these are the companies that will present in this second session. As a reminder, each of you will have three minutes to present. And at the end of the seven presentations, we will ask all of you listening today to vote on the company you think is the most promising. And we will recognize the top four most promising companies at the end of the session, the end of the program today, right before three o'clock. So with that, let's get started. The first company presenting uh, in this second session is, is Qualities. Please welcome Qualities. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. So I'm going to share my screen. Yep. We can hear you and we can see you. Uh, you cannot start screen share while your other person is sharing. Okay, I'm going to screen share now. Yep. Okay. Oh, You're good. And how you do? Uh, yeah, we can see that if you'll put that in full screen. Okay. Yes, uh, is it in full screen? Can you see that one? Yeah, it is there now. You're good to go. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Abhijit Chatterjee. I'm the Managing Director of Qualities. Qualities is a Canada-based corruption inspection and management company. We both have product and service segments. Qualities is a versatile team of the software de developer to material scientists to management experts. Now, corruption is a huge issue in the energy sectors. It costs alone in US $5 billion per year, and it also causes asset failure and environmental, environmental hazards. Now, when it comes to the corruption inspection, visual inspection plays a primary role and also easy to deploy. However, when it comes to the data analysis, it is still manual. There's a reason it takes, it takes a lot of time. They're also not able to extract a lot of information and prone to human error. Now, how we can solve this problem? We can make this image analysis by automating the system through machine learning based application. It will make the process not any faster by pixel by pixel analysis. It will make more accurate and it can actually extract a lot of information as well. Now, this is the reason uh, Qualities has developed Argos 1.21, a um, machine learning based computation te technology. It is a SaaS based application, so user can simply log in, upload the assets image, and then select the part of the asset, uh, select the part of the asset, and then click the analyze. And the user will be able to see the highlighted corrosion part on the asset. And not only that, the percentage of the corrosion coverage on the asset. Now there are only a few companies who have this computation technology to detect corrosion. However, we do have the unique advantage over quantitative analysis of the corrosion. That is the percentage of the corrosion because that means the predictive maintenance. Not only that, we have the unique functionality on the select the part of the asset the user is interested in. Now, when it comes to the market, the offshore inspection is growing with 11.9% and globally, it's worth $6 billion. We have a subscription-based model as well as a license-based model depending on the user. One of the client is already signed up for the trial and two clients we have submitted the proposal for the trial and one of the Canadian offshore energy operator also uh, showed, showed potentially interest for the demo. Now we are seeing, a, we can foresee exponential revenue growth uh, that can be achieved by both technological advancement and geographical and cross sectoral expansion. For example, Argus next version will be asset inspection and 3D digital tool. Now we, in order to achieve that growth, we are seeking $750,000 of the seed funding and also strategic collaborator for, for the R&D to bring in the next version of the Argus and the industry participant for the initial trials of the Argus 1.21. Thank you everyone. I would be happy to answer if you have any questions. Thanks. At this time, Q&A panelists, please join us with your uh, microphone unmuted and your camera on. 
Uh, hi, Abhijit. Uh, great presentation. Thanks. A uh, quick question. Um, can you uh, speak a little bit on, on your differentiation? Just trying to uh, grasp that a little better. Uh, if you can speak a little bit on, on, on the technology mode that you have. So you're talking about the competitive advantage that you mean in mission? No, your technology is uh, differentiation. Okay, so it is a machine learning based approach. Uh, so we do have uh, this machine learning algorithm that can detect the corrosion on the asset. And not only that, it will actually calculate the surf, this percentage of, of the surface coverage of the cor corrosion because that link the condition of the asset. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. And you can can you give us a little bit of uh, an example of kind of a, a pilot project you've run? I think I saw that you you've done a pro pilot project already. Yeah. Uh, so our clients is actually having a two month of trial, and so they are going to uh, they are actually going to apply uh, so many different type of assets images, and they are going to run through our software and try to see that uh, so how much is the efficiency, whether they are going to have the desired results or not. So that is the pilot which currently we are having. And currently we are actually getting a lot of good feedback till then. <laughs> Abhijit, to, to dovetail with Patrick's question, what is the deliverable in that demo? That's not clear to me. Oh, okay. So in the trial one, uh, so uh, so we actually gave a two months of subscription to them in a trial trial run. So they have their already some historical images, both the subsea asset and the offshore platform assets. Like, like like images, and they're running those images through our software to try to identify how that can be a greater advantage over manual industry practices when it's come to the image analysis. And till, till date, we actually got a positive feedback. Okay, I think, Patrick, does that help? Um, yeah, I think I'm, it helps a little bit. I'm like 75% like there. Is the, input, is the input to your model full, just visual inspection or is there anything else? It like is the, only the image. From, from, from the visual inspection, yes. Okay. The input data, yeah. Okay, so there's no pulse study current or any other uh, analyses of the actual, um, the walls or the, the material? Uh, no, only the, we are the Argus 1.21, the first version of this Argus is only capable to analyze the only the uh, 2D image, I would say, yes. Okay, so it's, it's simply visual inspection, got it, okay. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Can you explain the difference between subscription versus license? Yes, yeah, so the subscription is mainly for the end user and the license is for the service provider because they are going to, the service provider have a lot of end users in their client base. So we are providing the license, license base. So they, so that way, and the subscription base, it is more for a, like a, for the end user sub, subscription base. So if, so if they have a three corrosion engineer, they can have a multi-user sub subscription package but for the service base, they will have one license base. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Qualities. At this time, Q&A is over. We are going to move ahead to Adair. Thank you so much. I can see you if you want to go ahead and share your presentation. Hello, this is Karul Chaudhuri. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm the founder and CTO of Idea, and thanks for the opportunity to present. As uh, uh, you may be aware of a uh, recent uh, wave of uh, extreme heat and cold to wildfires to intense rainfall due to climate change and recent report from IPCC suggests that time is much shorter than we think. Energy transition certainly uh, be the main solution, but uh, can we do it within the next several years? Well, digitalization helps substantially. However, digitalization has its own challenges. The advanced digital system uh, we're talking about, it has to be scalable, configurable, deployable, and accurate, requires quite a bit of high skill levers and substantial technology adoptions throughout the industry and through cultural transformation, which is a major challenge. The way I dare see is digitalizing the digitalizations, make the digitalizations like automated, configurable, and scalable for the industry and have a digital replica creator uh, connected with a zero code analysis and decision making engine, which is configurable and scalable. And uh, that should shorten the substantial time for design and increase the operational efficiency. So the solution we have is the asset twin, which is available online right now. Uh, you can create a digital replica of your field assets within a fraction of a time. 
and uh, with uh, just having a PowerPoint skill with no technology adoptions, and which is also connected to a predictive uh, analytics, uh, which is totally automated and guidable like TurboTax. Having just MS Excel Excel, you should be able to solve complex problem. But on the other way, this is very uh, detail level configurable too. So, and this AutoML could be the first AutoML from the Houston as we see, but the simplicity of our system that integrated digital twin integrated with the predictive uh, built-in predictive solution system has given us a major competitive advantage over many of the bigger companies uh, because you require very less amount of technology adoption in terms of uh, deployment and scaling. So that opens up uh, for a uh, SaaS model for us and our opportunity in the digitalization is about $65 billion and we're immediately targeting asset twin and digital twin and auto ML market, which would be around 100 ML, uh, $100 million. But uh, though we're expending more than uh, what we are uh, earning right now, or this year revenue is around $150,000, we're expecting $50,000 more at the end of this year but we're uh, uh, getting into an, uh, quite a bit amount of growth in the next two to three years. So now we're seeking customers who can offer us jumpstart in uh, which, uh, who we can offer the jumpstart in digitalization, investors to scale and say, uh, support ourselves and strategic partners to complement their solutions. And finally, our mission is to automate the digitalization process uh, using either AI powered asset twin to expedite the energy transition to save the earth. And thank you very much. Thank you. Q&A panelists, please join us. Unmute yourselves and turn on your camera. Uh, hi, uh, Carol. Uh, good presentation. Uh, quick question. How are, you, how are you ingesting all different types of data to create this, this model? And, and, and the part two is, uh, are you pre-revenue right now? No, we're uh, we're generated some revenue uh, this year. We have generated hundred fifty thousand, so we're expecting end of this year this could be in around two hundred thousand. So uh, about the answer of the data ingestion, we are creating a system that is uh, very agnostic. Like you, you can uh, get the data from any uh, system that from URL or from your computer, or you can connect to any OPC connectors. So this is how we're doing, but we're doing it steps by steps based on the pilots going on with our customers. Okay, thank you. Lisa, did you wanna go? I think you had a question. No, I'm sorry, I did have a hand raised, but that was an accidental uh, press. But I will ask you, how did you quantify the size of the, the market? You had a $65 billion market opportunity, I believe. And I'm just curious how you came to that number. Okay, that is, uh, let's go with my, okay. So uh, this is from the market research from different organizations. Uh, we can send you the references. The asset integrity size is $37 billion. And is and uh, though I mean that is on the oil and gas side, and the mm. digital twin side is about fifteen point seven, and uh, but uh, oil and gas has uh, I guess seventy percent out of it, and the auto ML is the overall generic auto ML throughout the world, the global uh, uh, global market because the way we configure our auto ML though now we configured it for oil and gas energy, mm. but uh, what we saw that we just, we configured it as such. So you can solve even problem in the healthcare. They like uh, last year we solved problem for COVID predictions and dengue cases for Bangladesh and uh, do hospital resource management using our auto ML engine. Thank you. Okay, well, quick question for you. Who, um, who's your customer here? That's not 100% clear to me. Okay. Is it our developer, is it the asset owner? Is it uh, service providers? Uh, our customer is mainly uh, operators uh, in the sense that in the asset integrity side and the digital twin side, it could be the contractors uh, who are in the design because our digital twin uh, is helpful in design and uh, concept development. So it will be the contractors and the operators both sides. And uh, for the auto ML, it's pretty generic. I mean, uh, there are built-in predictive solutions mostly for the operators 
but uh, who are uh, third party contractors uh, support supported uh, the operators for data analytics service they can do it uh, very fortunately easily. we are at time i apologize i dare but we need to move on to our next uh, presenter robos is up next thank you q and a panelists All right, thank you very much. Do you hear me? I can see you, I can hear you. If you wanna go ahead and share your screen. Perfect. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now. Go ahead and put it in presentation mode and then you may begin. Okay, awesome. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Arash Shadravan. I'm the Robo's Energy Business Development Manager. It's a pleasure today to have this opportunity to present our worldwide solution to you. Uh, we are Robos. We are a 3D printing company specializing in 3D printing non-metallics. We have our headquarters in uh, Bari, Italy and Houston, Texas. The customers that uh, we serve, they're in aerospace, energy, robotics, mobility, defense, acad academia, manufacturing, medical and chemical. Uh, the value creation by industrial additive manufacturing these days, you know, is, is, is what you... Uh, is uh, you know, drawing a lot of attention to itself because it's, this technology is creating serious tangible business values. The first value that I wanna to talk to you about is a cost and time saving. Things that whether COVID-19 or a ship getting stuck uh, in a Suez Canal or for those of, those of you in Texas, you've seen like Texas freeze. Uh, these are familiar examples that supply chain disruption could happen to us. Uh, safety and sustainability and operational continuity. If something happens and something breaks, you can on-demand 3D print parts that can go into operation. And also from a manufacturing perspective, you know, the, the complex geometries that would take, you know, months for conventional manufacturing. Today, they're enabled by additive manufacturing, our technology. We also can, can provide rapid functional prototyping in a small batches number. When, when you're operating and you need five, you need 100, you need 50 parts, not 5,000 parts. So uh, this is all the, the, the enablers. Our leadership team are, is distributed across the US and Europe. Uh, we have people that they've worked in the larger oil and gas company. In my background, I do have a PhD in material science, work for ExxonMobil as a materials and corrosion engineer, prior to joining Robos, and prior to that, I worked uh, for Baker Hughes. But we have a very diverse team with, uh, you know, years and years of 3D printing experience, and our verticals uh, are in, uh, as such. But you might ask, you know, what's the Robos business model in the energy sector? Very simple. We sell and lease 3D printers because we develop them. We, we sell our robots materials, basically, and, a 3D, uh, and the third one is 3D parts, which manufacturing as a service. If you're not buying a printer or buying, a, uh, buying or leasing the printer immediately, you might want some parts for us you know, to print for you, and we can do that. The size of the prize is about $2 billion, okay, uh, by the uh, year 2029. Uh, I wanted to emphasize on, you know, why this technology, why our 3D printers is distinguished, you know, versus others. We do have, we do have, we hold a patent on this helical gear, which is the heart of a CNC machine. We patented it for 3D printing. And therefore, you know, uh, processing these uh, super polymeric materials requires a high temperature and a, basically an oven. And so a, a lot of other 3D printing companies, they have a belt, a rubber belt. And when they expose the rubber belt into a heated chamber, it stretches. Therefore, the dimensional accuracy is compromised. We enable 10 micron positioning accuracy on an XY plane, which is very unique uh, for our technology. On top of that, we have a lot of other patent pending uh, uh, basic pieces. We basically announced the largest composite and polymeric materials, 3D printing materials uh, in the world. Uh, this is called Argo 1000, and, and we're the basically the company that is, is manufacturing as early as next year. Currently, we do have uh, Argo 500, which 500 stands for 500 millimeter by 500 millimeter by 500 millimeter build volume. Thank you, Robo. At this time, we are going to move on to Q&A. So, okay. panel, you want to go ahead and unmute and turn on your camera. Thanks, Arash. Is this a, um, are you building it like a, um, manufacturing as a service marketplace, I think. And then the question is, does it require Robo's printers on kind of the base level for that? Yes, Patrick. Basically, you know, uh, our technology enables, if you 3D print a part in Singapore, Houston, or Canada, 
or, or in Angola or Guyana, basically that part would be similar. And that's the catch-22 for a lot of 3D printing companies that they cannot enable them. So for printing as service, we have a robust distributed manufacturing, a lot of partners that they do have our technology. And if they want to print a part in Angola, they simply send the part to our Angolan uh, partner who has the Argo technology. And then the, the build out and scale up of that marketplace will be driven by printer sales and those are to being other distributors or how, how do you, how do you guys scale this thing? So scalability is uh, we, we get new partners. They all have a, a certain established pipeline already for manufacturers, you know, so they've been manufacturing uh, non-metallic parts for years and years. Uh, so they, they're already established. They know they have the those pipelines. So we equip them. We put one more part in their uh, toolbox basically to, to uh, print uh, parts on demand. And can you speak to the, the safety of the parts and, um, you know, do they decompose quicker than the, the original parts? Can you, you know, I'm assuming this is going into machinery and how, do, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Lisa, thanks for the questions. You know, basically mm -hmm. uh, compressor plates, you know, so, an example. We have we 3D print materials, carbon peak and peak. These no, basically other companies cannot 3D print these materials. And the reason that makes these materials unique is because they're corrosion and fatigue and high temperature resistance. You can go to you know, 200 ATC uh, temperature limit with this super polymeric material. So they're not cheap plastics, they're high performance materials and they enable industrial applications until today until robos, and you know, we've been in the business for seven years, you know, Argo 500, people were doing 3D printing for uh, basically uh, just prototyping. We are bringing this to the next level of industrial application. Thank you. Robert, you want to ask the last one or you want me to? I, I was just going to make a comment about Arash's passion, but I think that that doesn't need to be highlighted. So take, take it over, AJ. Uh, Arash, uh, quickly, can you uh, speak a little bit on the unit economics? Uh, how much does, yeah. Yeah, so, so every, every uh, printer basically costs about a quarter million dollars. And uh, if you save, a, you know, one, one offshore rig per day is cost a million dollars. So if you can save a quarter of a day of an offshore rig time, basically your printer, 3D printers is paid. And, and so we, so much. This is unfortunately, we are at time for Q&A. Apologize, Robos. We are moving on to Matador. Thank you, Q&A panelists. Sean, I can see um, you. Do you want to go ahead and share your presentation? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. Cool. So I'll just jump right into it. So uh, my name is Sean. I'm the co-founder at Matador, uh, where we simplify project management on a live map. So the problem with any form of digging, mining, uh, or developing when it comes to natural resources is that there's no easy way to keep track of any environmental impact, activities, cost, um, and even mapping across multiple locations. And today, archaic tools like spreadsheets and very hard to use mapping software have still really plagued the industry. Employees waste up to two hours per day accessing information from silos that don't speak well with each other. Incomplete map results uh, often results in 30% more unnecessary site visit travel. Our solution to that is by building a very intuitive project management software on a live map, which is very collaborative at the same time. So with Matador, you can simply create projects on the go, uh, be able to visualize your portfolio of projects very easily. You can keep track of costs, expenditure, and be able to really collaborate with multiple different parties. So it's as easy as creating a project, typing a location, so you can select any location, use preset templates, and we have the ability to really configure different templates to suit different project needs. You can also assign tasks, um, invite people to the platform very seamlessly, even smart geotagging. So you can take photos to a specific location. And most of our clients have really found it useful uh, when working on environmental related projects inside oil and gas like reclamation, remediation, asset retirement. Um, you can also draw on our map, import different financial data, as well as um, other relevant key data information as well. So the global market right now is 4 billion. Um, this is bottoms up. We're averaging about 100,000 per company, and there's about 40,000 natural resource uh, company uh, inside North America. And we believe our total addressable market is actually greater than that at 50 billion, which is targeting companies that really need location-based industries. So how do we really stack up with competitors? We're very intuitive, um, but we also have the ability to configure uh, templates to suit different needs. So we fall perfectly within the realm of project management and mapping. If you look at Esri, um, you know, SAP, Oracle, 
they're very good at what they do um, as standalone ERPs, but getting them to work together is a pain in the butt. So our traction so far is, um, you know, we're at 80K ARR, um, but we have 500K in terms of pilot that will come in the next three months. Uh, we have signed on Imperial, Petronas, as well as working with GHD and Arab as well. We have also came second place at last year's startup Battlefield, um, as well as a pitch finalist at South by Southwest. And we have won Emerging Rocket Clean Tech Award uh, twice in a row, as well as Best Innovation in Small Business BC this year. So both Vincent and I are multiple times founder. Uh, Vincent worked at Google Earth as a technical lead. That's where his GIS background came from. I have over 10 years in sales and business development, as well as some cross-border um, experience as well. So our ask is, um, you know, partnership, municipalities, be able to really work with upstream producer and exploration companies. Um, and currently we're at a stage where we're oversubscribed on our seed round, um, but looking for more um, potential funding to launch open APIs uh, coming uh, next quarter. So thank you, my name is Sean, um, and I'll open up for Q and A. Hey Sean, good job. Uh, are you in Van, by the way? Uh, I'm I'm in Vancouver, but uh, I'm actually currently at OTC. Um, I'm okay. actually at, at the conference. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. Yeah, I'm in Van as well. So. Um, Tell me, uh, you said average 100K per annum per, per customer. It wasn't clear to me what that 100K was. Um, that's an annual subscription license fee. So we're charging uh, per, uh, per company. Yeah. So, so 100K uh, per company per year and? On, on average, yeah. So uh, for okay. small, medium sized operators, we typically charge anywhere from 40 to 90K per year annual subscription. Uh, for the larger company, if you look at uh, Petronas, or if you look at Imperial, uh, we're potentially signing them on for at least 250,000. So it's just like the average uh, of the mid-size plus the larger companies. Um, and to really expedite the sales process with larger companies, we've actually found doing a pilot to be really fruitful. So it kind of speed up the procurement and IT process working with larger companies. Excellent, thanks. Yep. Um Sean, uh, great presentation. Uh, can you uh, speak a little bit on your ideal customer profile? Because you, you're doing it across the, the spectrum. You know, you have the big uh, companies as well, small. How do you, what is what is the ideal customer profile? Yeah, so our ideal customers are upstream oil and gas companies, typically within the environmental health safety department. So EHS managers, operation managers, um, even some of the folks from land department as well. So anytime they need to um, manage or monitor assets in the field, um, and then on the flip side, um, so that would be our type A customer. Type B would be the environmental consultants or services company. Um, so our platform essentially bridge uh, the two parties together uh, on one platform, right? Instead of, you know, using four or five different software to manage different projects. Thank you. And on the two, on the expand within a current customer, are you, are you charging more on a user account basis or on a project basis? Or how, do, how does the model scale with customers? Yep. Uh, so we're very different than other software is that we don't limit seats. Um, so we offer unlimited user access. And because of that, we've seen a network effect as users start to promote and actually invite more clients onto the platform. So we charge, we used to charge per project basis. Um, but right now we actually simplify into an inclusive tier pricing. So, you know, uh, the first tier will begin at 100 projects per year. The second tier will be at 200 projects, 500 projects, then 1000 projects. So we used to have a base license fee plus per project on top, but we just found it to be a lot easier onboarding clients and signing people up by really just simplifying pricing, right? We don't want to overcomplicate things and always emphasizing the unlimited user access. Thanks. Thank you, Matador. At this time, Q&A is over. We are moving on to Data Seer. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Sean. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes, you are good to go. Um, I do not see your video, though. Uh, okay, there we go. If you just want to present your slides again, you should be good to go. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Joanne Ting, and I'm here to introduce to you Data Seer, where AI and industrial drawings meet. Data is tracked in scanned images and paper drawings. If you don't have access to the source CAD files, you have to work with images until you can digitize them. Think of project bidding or working on, on upgrades to existing facilities. 
search is manual and time consuming across thousands of diagrams you may have in a project or across projects. And finally, there is no easy way to share, store, and manage diagram images. Our solution is Datasphere, a web application that detects, extracts, and digitizes data from technical diagrams and data sheets. We currently address PNIDs, but our technology can scale for different diagram types. Our product features computer vision to recognize objects, text, and lines in an image, machine learning to train and update models continually based on data observed to date, and intuitive workflows to make it easy for the user to get feedback in this human in the loop system. <clears throat> Datasphere can, can help you extract, digitize, search, compare, share, and manage your technical diagrams and data sheets. Our company was formed January this year from a partnership between Arundo Analytics and Worley. We've secured 13 customer logos to date and are expanding beyond EPC to other sectors such as water, chemicals, and pharma. Our ambition is to capture a third of the $300 million spent annually on legacy diagrams. This is a high margin SaaS product where market value can increase as we expand feature growth and also expansion to other diagram types. Our main competitors are services companies that use offshore resources to do manual work. There are some small players in the SaaS and AI space, but there is no industrial grade solution, nor is there a leading market contender. We are a subscription-based SaaS product. We offer, offer concurrent licensing and a free one-week trial for customers to try before subscribing. We have a strong sales pipeline of prospective clients that include not only EPCs, but also operators, offshore outsources, and professional services. In closing, Datasphere brings human-level understanding and machine speed to build a scalable knowledge data store of engineering designs. This creates massive value for operators, engineers, and builders by generating insights from their existing data. Our ask today is for corporate partners to help scale this product. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, I can, I can go first. Uh, great presentation, Joanne. Um, what are some of the limitations? What kind of file formats does the data share platform not support? So we currently take images in PDF format. Um, and so currently users would have to convert their TIFF, PNG, JPEGs into PDF. Uh, but certainly we're planning to expand the input to make it flexible. So any kind of image file can be uploaded. And the differentiation is the one, once it's converted into a PDF format, you're able to extract and, and uh, basically digitize uh, uh, the, the, the hand drawings and all, right? I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to understand a little bit more on the differentiation piece. So, so it's really images, right? So a PDF could contain potentially metadata in there. We're currently not um, searching and crawling through that. Uh, so really the, the unique value sort of proposition here is images be it hand-drawn or even digital or, you know, scanned. Thank you. And Joanne, um, I'm curious. So uh, users are uploading their data. There might be some alteration of it. Who owns the data? Do they, does the customer continue to own the data and whenever they choose to leave, continues to own the data? Um, correct. So they own the data. Uh, now we, upload, update, train our models and algorithms based on the data we've seen. So yes, they can delete their data at any point in time, but our models and algorithms basically observe and learn from that. Thank you. Joanne, can you, once you've ingested the data, you put it in a format, is it, can you query that data like large corpus, corpus yes. of information? Yes, yes, you can. So we have the image files, but then we have extracted entities, you know, we know the semantics of what is being extracted and also how they relate to other entities within the, di the diagram, of course. And so you're, are you building some sort of a knowledge cloud that you can begin to, to draw linkages between them? Correct, especially on PNIDs and any kind of diagrams, right? When you have connectors, off-page connectors, you could actually view the entire subsystem uh, zoomed out in bird's eye view. That's very cool. 
And how you charge like a one-time upload fee and then a recurring network fee or how are you charging more? Uh, currently it's a subscription model. So, you know, monthly usage. Um, we're still experimenting with our pricing. Uh, yeah. So there's some fixed costs and of course variable based on usage. Got it. How, how time intensive is the first part of that process? In terms of time Just intensive? The upload and data input and all that. Oh, oh well, it's it's a cloud base, you know, we have auto scaling on our side. So if say demand suddenly peaks up in a certain part of the world, we have sort of auto scaling to adjust for the machines. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Nice job, Joanne. Cheers. Thank you so much, Q&A panelists. Thank you, Daddy Sierra. We are going to move on to Alabastron Technologies. Can you uh, see and hear me? Hi, Steve. Yes, I can see you. If you want to go ahead and present your presentation. Also, I can hear you. You are good to go. Great. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Lewis. I'm with Alabastron Technologies, and today I'm going to share with you a solution that will eliminate this, wax and scale deposits in our pipelines. The solution is with a nanomaterial that can induce paraffin or scale well before those deposits would develop inside a carbon steel pipe. Tests performed at Rice University show that when a brine solution flows through our nanomaterial, significant buildup will occur as compared to a standard pipe. So here's how it's used. Our alabastron nanomaterial is coated inside a tube and connected within a secondary flow path. If deposits start to form, the operators are instantly alerted so they can take proactive measures before buildup forms in the main pipeline. Conversely though, if deposits are not forming on the nanomaterial, then operators can reduce their chemical dosage without worry. And our market intelligence tells us we overdose our pipelines by as much as 200% this is a huge waste, and therefore Alabastron could significantly lower your op OPEX costs and save time and offer in the ESG play, given the toxicity of those chemicals. But this isn't just a good conceptual idea. We have a field qualified unit working for the past nearly 24 months where the operator has been able to reduce their chemical usage by 20% without any downtime or reduced production. What this means for an average oil field in the Eagleford, for instance, is an annual savings of $25,000 per well just from using less chemicals. This does not take into consideration the savings of fewer ping operations, optimized flow rates, and less downtime. So with nearly 1 million active oil and gas wells in the US, according to the EIA in 2019, this has an extensive market potential both onshore and offshore as it could be easily installed topside. Our ask is to raise $225,000 to complete our beta trials and partner with companies interested in pilot programs for their existing and planned assets. We believe that given the track record out in the field, we will quickly reach a cash flow positive position and profitability by end of year two. Our team is comprised of our inventor, Dr. Luke Wang, whose postdoctorate work at Rice contributed to this technology. Luke owns the patent and the company outright with zero debt. Rick Jones, who has successfully started and exited multiple startups, and myself, who has 20 years of oil and gas pipeline experience and supported several successful startups. Our board of advisors are second to none with technical, commercial, and financial expertise. At Alabastron Technologies, our vision is to enable low cost, low maintenance pipelines across the US and internationally. Please feel free to reach out to us if you share that vision. Thank you. Q and A panelists, please join us and unmute yourselves and turn on your camera. Hey, thanks, Steve. So, is this a um, this a hardware play as well? So, does, will it require your equipment and kind of ongoing service at every well site you uh, you you analyze? Exactly. Yeah, where there is a a tube. Uh, right now, our prototype is about a thirty six inch long tube with the nanomaterial coated inside of it. Um, we will attach with flanges and valves so that it can be easily inserted to any kind of slipstream 
a bypass that a pipeline currently has in their pipeline. Got it. And then so I guess challenges to scale would be from an equipment perspective and then also build it. Would it require you to build kind of a 24 seven service organization as well? That's one of the commercial models we have, whether we, we plug into something existing infrastructure or we try to build that ourselves. Correct. Okay. Thanks. Just piggybacking off of what Patrick asked, uh, from a go-to-market uh, positioning, are you going directly or you kind of uh, have channel partners or how are you going to the market? Sure. So, you know, I've been advising IP-backed uh, energy companies, startups for a while, for three years, and the clients tell us they're looking for tech that is plug and play on existing project or asset where there's existing cash flow and where they can offer significant savings or additional uh, revenue. So that's what we're... Uh, that's the targets that we have. Um, our objective is to add Alabaster onto the arsenal of tools that operators already use and to do so with proven speed. So we're in the early process of identifying the most expedient commercial models from selling units directly, going through channel partners, licensing the technology, or perhaps a phase approach involving all three. Okay, thank you. Steve, if you looked at uh, moving into transportation, larger pipelines, you know, sitting in Canada, you know, transportation to the North America, North, uh, the American market is very important, and Dilluan is a is a big uh, is a big cost uh, cogs. Have you have you looked aggressively into that? Yes, that's we identified really the midstream as as a key user of this. You know, a typical pipeline that has forty eight inch uh, pipe size, even a quarter inch growth. Um, can reduce per production by two and a half percent. So just assuming a fifty dollar barrel of oil, I hope I'm not being overly uh, aggressive there with the with that forecast for fifty dollars. But just using fifty dollars, using the amount of wells and uh, how much product we transport, especially uh, from Canada, the, the numbers start to get really, really ridiculously high in terms of savings. An average oil and gas producer um, in the Eagleford stands to use uh, achieve $75 million per year of additional production. But uh, we wanted to start with just looking at how much chemicals they can save as a way to really prove out this model. Great. Thank you, Alabastron. Thank you, Q&A panelists. We are at time. Moving on to our final presentation. Lolantos, Lolantos, will you please join us? I see you, I'm gonna go and present. You are good to go. Hello, everyone. My name is Telios, and I'm a co-founder of Lelantos. At Lelantos, we are revolutionizing the world of gas sensing by developing a new generation of IoT-compatible gas sensors for high-value monitoring applications. Our beachhead use case is the detection of methane emissions in the oil and gas industry. One third of methane emissions originate from the oil and gas industry with 82 million tons per year and a financial losses of up to $64 billion. Um, based on strict environmental regulations, but even more so from a clear financial perspective, oil companies are trying to keep natural gas as a cleaner alternative to coal and also pushed by sustainable investors. So to that point, the 80 largest companies uh, responsible for one third of the global production have committed to reduce uh, there were admissions by 10 times. It is also agreed upon that 30% of these leaks are fixable at zero net cost. And the best way of doing this is reducing the cost of pervasive monitoring solutions. As such, we see a clear unmet market need for large scale distributed persistent leak monitoring solutions. Unfortunately, the problem is that current sensors prohibit the effective monitoring according to these IoT standards as they suffer from large size high power consumption and are expensive. Simply the problem is visualized by the following trend. There is a trade-off between performance and size, power and cost, which are essential properties that need to be minimized for IoT applications. So for example, in the method use case, current methods rely on high performance yet very expensive infrared cameras utilized for manual uh, scans of the facilities once or twice a year. However, because these leaks are highly time variable and occur by large areas, these methods prohibit the effective mitigation of the problem. On the contrary, we have developed an approach based on CMOS integrated piezoelectric resonators that allows to significantly bridge this gap. So this is a gas sensor technology that detects the mass of the gas molecules when they absorb to the sensor surface by a change in resonant frequency. 
by um, adding receptors to the surface, we can achieve selectivity and multi-gas detection ability. Um, we possess IP for the fabrication of these structures directly onto CMOS chips, and this allows us for devices with up to a thousand times smaller size, lower power, and lower cost than conventional techniques with superior performance. As such, we can see that this is an optimal technology for IoT applications. It is a foundationally superior technology, and we believe that it can enable the disruption of the market. Our vision is to revolutionize gas sensing, and we believe that we have the unique technology to achieve so. We're currently asking for strategic partners in the space, as well as investors, to help raise our two million seed round. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. At this time, Q&A panelists, please join us. Unmute yourselves and turn on your camera. Uh, Stelanos, can you tell us uh, what level of fidelity you can currently detect at? Yes, so currently for methane uh, applications, our, our demonstrations have showed um, uh, a, a limit of 1,000 ppms. Uh, we believe that this is much lower than the usual uh, leaks, which happen at uh, 10,000 to 100,000 ppms. So this is way below uh, the, 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 the leak. Uh, in other applications, again, it depends on the application. We can go down to much lower um, limits of detection when going into a CMOS integrated product. All of this has been done on PCB prototypes. So uh, there's room for a lot of um, improvement as well for the fidelity. And can you quant, have you shown the ability to quantify? Yes, so we quantify the leaks. Uh, the, the, um, the, the, the percentage, as I said, the, the, the limit of detection that we've shown up to date is 1000 PPM. So anything above 1000, uh, we can detect with these uh, prototypes. Okay, all for me. Do you, do you have like patterns uh, or, or uh, I mean, how are you doing it? Do you have like a kind of a barrier to entry from an IP perspective? Yes, uh, we have the freedom to operate in the space. We, we possess three patterns that secure our, our position. We are the only technology that enables gravimetric approach directly on CMOS uh, chips. And this is what gives us the unique advantage of the very small size, very low power consumption and very low cost that enables the mass deployment of these in mass scale, which has currently been withheld because of the, uh, the weaknesses that current technologies suffer from. So um, this is where we uh, this is where we secure uh, RIP, yes. Thanks, can you, can you talk a little bit about supply chain partners? Yes, so our technology um, benefits from full wafer processing, so like a, like a computer microchip. We have currently secured the foundry that uh, will uh, is manufacturing our chips for us. And then uh, we act as a fabulous OEM where we sell these components to system integrator partners who then manufacture the total gas sensor monitor that is then sold to uh, facility owners uh, or equipment manufacturers. So we, uh, we, we identify ourselves as uh, component suppliers. So just a chip that goes inside the final box that has the wireless connectivity, the battery, and all the, the rest. So these are who we identify as our customers, the system integrators. Thank you so much, Q&A panelists. Thank you, Luantos. Um, Thank you. Our Q&A and our final presentation. All right, so we have just one last thing to do, and it'll just take a couple of minutes, and that is that we are going to do the final poll and then announce the most promising companies. So if you would launch the poll and then vote on your company of the seven companies in the second session, if you would vote on the company that you think is most promising, we will real time tabulate the results and in about two minutes, we will announce those. So if you will take a minute and you will vote on the company that you think is most promising, we will announce the results from both the first session and the second session in just about two minutes and we'll be done way uh, before 3, uh, 3 p.m. today. I do wanna thank the companies in the second section. Again, I know it's really tough to pitch your company within three minutes, but I think you all did a great job, both the companies in the first session and the companies in the second session. So congratulations to all 14 companies that presented today and pitched today. You guys did a great job and came all the way from 
as far as the UK and in the US from all across the US and from Canada. So thank you very much for all the companies that participated today in the Rice Alliance Venture Day at OTC. I also wanted to thank the panelists who participated and asked questions in this last session. So Robert Allen from Evoke Innovations, Patrick Conroy from Amberjack Capital Partners, Lisa Zevers from Phillips 66, and Abhinav Jain from CSL Ventures. Thank you guys for your lending your expertise to ask questions to the companies that pitched real time, knowing that it's almost as tough to, to uh, structure your questions within a three minute period of time as it is for a company to pitch within three minutes. So thank you very much to all the companies and all the panelists who participated today. And just a reminder, if you haven't, I think the poll's closed, but vote if you still see the poll. If not, we'll be tabulating, we're tabulating results and we'll bring those to you in just about a minute. And as a reminder about upcoming events, so our Clean Energy Accelerator that launched its first class this year will celebrate by having a demo day on, uh, by having a demo day on September 16th. So stay tuned for the next Rice Alliance event, which will be the demo day on September 16th. And if you could go to the next slide, Shana, I think that you're driving this one. Thanks. And a big thanks to our, as I said earlier, when we started this off, big thanks to our energy sponsors for our energy programs in 2021. You see all of our sponsors here at all of our tiers and we appreciate those because we could not bring programs uh, to you like this without the support of our sponsors. I know it sounds trite, but it's real. And we appreciate the support of all of you who help make the Rice Alliance energy programs possible, including all of our community supporters. And as I uh, gave a shout out earlier, thanks to the Canadian consulate who always in, is involved with us in bringing Canadian companies to bear. You go to the next slide, we'll talk about the upcoming events. I just mentioned the Clean Energy Accelerator, we will have a virtual demo day on September 16th for the dozen or so companies in the first ever Rice Alliance Clean Energy Accelerator. So please join us on September 16th and be sure to be here in person on January 27th. We have rescheduled our 19th annual Rice Alliance Energy Tech Venture Forum for January 27th when knock on wood, we'll all be back in person and be able to bring that to you on September 20, uh, sorry, not September, but January 27th. So mark your calendars now. And with that, let's go on to announce the most promising companies. And in order to announce the most promising, I'm really pleased to introduce a friend of mine, Felix Phillips. And Felix, I can't see you yet, but I'm sure I'll be able to see you in a minute, but that's okay because I have a word, there you are. <laughs> Welcome today. Hi, Brad. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to have you here to announce the most promising companies. Baker Butts has been a supporter of the Rice Alliance since almost the beginning of the Rice Alliance for around 20 years. And you know, a supporter of Rice University for more than 100 years because Rice was involved in the formation of Rice when we first got started. And that's a great story. And I'll tell it to you sometime when we have more time. But I would tell you that a major focus of Baker Butts is around emerging companies and venture capital. And Felix has been involved in this a long time. Felix, I know you were in Silicon Valley before you came back to Houston in 1996. And I think you've probably been involved in the Rice Alliance since, since uh, you, you came back to Houston. But I know you're involved in all aspects of venture capital, mergers and acquisitions and security offerings. And with that, I'll turn it over to you but say it's a great pleasure to see you today. And I appreciate you announcing the most promising companies that our folks in the background have been tabulating real time for you. Great, Brad, thank you for that introduction. As Brad mentioned, I'm Felix Phillips. I'm a corporate partner in the Houston office of Baker Botts. I co-lead our Houston ECVC or Emerging Company Venture Capital Practice group here. I also have supported and served on the advisory board for the Rice Alliance for Technology and Entrepreneurship for close to 20 years now. I've worked with technology startups for my entire career, initially, as Brad mentioned, in Silicon Valley, and for the past 20 plus years here in Houston. Today, on behalf of Baker Botts, I am very pleased to announce the four most promising companies at the Rice Alliance Energy Venture Day at OTC. 
And now the first company, American Hydrogen, congratulations. The next company, Alabastron. Congratulations to Alabastron. And now Applied Bioplastics. Congratulations to Applied Bioplastics. Finally, Datasear. Congratulations to our, our fourth most promising uh, company today. On behalf of Baker Botts, we would like to send a special thank you for all of the companies that participated in today's Energy Venture Day. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Brad? Felix, thanks so much. Uh, I really appreciate you jumping in to announce the most promising companies. Congratulations to those companies. Those were based on the votes of all of you who participated today. So congratulations to the four companies uh, that have received the most promising award. And for all of you, we look forward to seeing you about a month from now on September 16th at the virtual Clean Energy Accelerator Demo Day. And to all of you, we look forward to uh, seeing you at whichever of the next Rice Alliance events you're able to attend. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us today at the 2021 Rice Alliance Venture Day at OTC. Thank you and have a good afternoon.